Howdy, everyone. Howdy. Pleasure to uh, be here, as always. Um, 137 veterans uh, that were interviewed, actually, there were about 150 shows on Veterans of the Valley on KAMU. Uh, a lot of the veterans, their story couldn't be told in one 30-minute episode, and they, there was a part two of, of, their, of their episodes. We also had some special programming. For example, um, the uh, producer of the show, uh, who's now retired, Kyle Netterville and I, were invited to uh, go to Washington, D.C. on a uh, honor flight uh, back in uh, 2010. And what a thrill that was. And we ended up doing a three-part show on that, uh, flying to Washington, D.C. with the World War II veterans. So uh, there's actually, were actually a lot more shows than that. And KAMU is going to be uh, actually presenting some of those shows in their entirety in May. And Matt Dittman from KAMU is here, and I'm going to have him get up here uh, at the end and tell you a little bit about that. Um, I, I'm not a veteran, and I've always made that very clear. I, I did uh, serve in, uh, I did not serve in uniform. Uh, but I did attend a military grade school and high school in San Antonio. So I, I, I know how, I, no, I don't know how, I knew how to field dress an M1 rifle. We did that in ROTC class. And I knew my general orders. Don't ask me them now. But we were required to learn those things when I was in high school at Texas Military Institute in San Antonio and San Antonio Academy. Um, so, that, but that's about as far as it goes is my for my military uh, expertise. Uh, my passion for honoring veterans uh, was because of, excuse me, because of this man. This is Lieutenant Bob Butler, and he was a, a Navy pilot and an instructor with VF-27 in the Pacific during World War II. In May of 1944, uh, during a strafing mission, exercise over uh, Barking Sands in Hawaii. One of his uh, trainees accidentally clipped his tail and uh, he crashed into the beach at Barking Sands and was killed instantly. Uh, Bob Butler, Lieutenant Bob Butler, was my mother's husband and her first husband. And when he was killed, they had a two-year-old and one on the way. Uh, my mother, fortunately, uh, found love again with Mr. C.F. Turbyville, and they had me. So you can understand that I honor his memory just because of the, the fate that his death resulted in my birth. And that's why I do this, because of that gentleman right there. He is being he's pictured in his uh, uh, F6F Hellcat. Uh, made by Grumman. VF-27 is the, is the squadron that you've seen many pictures of the Hellcat, I know you have, with the cat's mouth nose art on it. That was VF-27. And he was killed in one of those airplanes. So I wanted to introduce you to Lieutenant Butler, and that's the reason that I do this. All right, um, the list of uh, veterans which are on the sheets of paper uh, that you uh, put at the table, and if you didn't get one, there's more uh, that I put in the, uh, in the back. Um, those are all of the veterans that were interviewed on Veterans of the Valley. And each one of those, we didn't just get them in the studio and sit them down just cold and me start, you know, roll tape and me start a a asking them questions. I went to every one of their homes uh, the day before or a couple of days before we mic'd them up and brought them to the studio just to find out uh, their story. So I could find out their story, just sitting in their living room, sitting at their kitchen table. And, uh, and I was running a small recorder for all of that. So besides this spoken history and video history that we have of these veterans, all from the Brazos Valley area. Um, we also have audio 
history of these informal conversations that I, that I have. And uh, I have those. And uh, so there's a, a lot of history uh, that we've been able to keep. Because you can see on that list, uh, the ones with asterisks by them are no longer with us. The vast majority of the 137 veterans have passed away. And those are mainly World War II veterans and a lot of Vietnam veterans. Um, I'm going to uh, play segments of some selected shows that we did. And uh, with some of the, I'm not gonna say these are the, the best of the best, because they were all the best. Uh, whether they were in combat or not, uh, they all served, they all had a story, every single one of them. Some stories more compelling than others, sure, and they were quick to say that. Some of them they didn't think were compelling, but they were compelling. And it was my, my honor to, uh, to interview them. Uh, you're gonna see, this is over a span of six years from 2005 to 2011 that we did these interviews. You're gonna see me in different forms of hairline and weight. Um, I'm happy to say that you're, the way you're seeing me now is about the, is the least hairline and the least weight uh, of all, so I'm happy to say that. Um, so we're gonna get started. And uh, I invited Ann Boykin here today, but she could not uh, be here today because the first person we're gonna start with is her dad, uh, Calvin Boykin. And rather than me give an introduction to each one of these veterans that we're gonna see, I'm gonna actually uh, let you see the introduction that I gave on the show. So we're going to uh, start right now. And this first time you're gonna see the introduction that the KAMU people did for each one of our shows our uh, video introduction, which I thought was, was very, very good. So we'll get started, and this is uh, Calvin Boykin, who served in Europe in World War II. Welcome to Veterans of the Valley. I'm Tom Turbeville. The proud story of the 814th Tank Destroyer Battalion is told in the words written by Cal Boykin of College Station, a historian of the 814th. Cal Boykin was a gunner atop his M8 armored car on recon duty in World War II's European campaign, patrolling the French roads behind Normandy, through Belgium and Holland, on to Germany. It is our honor to welcome Cal Boykin, Jr. of College Station to Veterans of the Valley. Cal, it is an honor to have you here. Your A&M class of 1946. 1946. <laughs> You've lived here a long time. Now, you were born in Roswell, New Mexico in 1924. Right. 1924, and that was 12 years after New Mexico became a state. Uh -huh. And quite a number of years before the E.T. landed in, in, in Roswell. <laughs> you were somewhere in between those in two. In there, right. You didn't, uh, weren't in New Mexico long, actually. You grew up in, uh, in Big Spring, and it was that right. time when you were a youth and you were playing sports in high oh, school yeah, that right. you decided that the war had broken out, and you decided that you needed some military training, and that's where Texas A&M came into it. Right. Sort of talk about your youth. Well, there. I had never been to A&M. Mm -hmm. I had some friends, uh, of course I lived on a farm at Rochelle with my grandmother for a while and I knew some graduates or seniors with their boots and all and I was anxious to get to A&M for that reason as in, in addition to being able to be ready to go into service when when I was called. Now you grew up in Rochelle which is near Brady which is where Earl Rudder uh, was a coach for yes, a while, Yes, he was right? coaching high school football while I was playing on the uh, grammar school Rochelle team. Right. <laughs> right, right. Uh, you went back to Big Spring, uh, 16 years old. That's when you decided you want the military training, and you came to A&M right. in 1942. Talk about A&M in the early 40s as the war was, as uh, the United States was just getting into the war. Well, it was, it was a, a busy place. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. There were over 7,000 students, and maybe close to 8,000. And uh, they were getting ready to go. And what happened, the... Uh, 
the draft age was lowered to 18. Mm -hmm. I believe it was November of 42. See, I started in June of 42 on that tri-semester right. speeded up program. And uh, so many decided they'd, uh, they'd go that route, mm -hmm. enlist in the enlist reserve corps. Right. Well, I decided not to do anything. I went home, checked with my draft board, and the young blonde there said, uh, you volunteer and uh, you get your choice branch of service. And I said, well, sure, Air Corps. So I signed up, and two <laughs> weeks later, I was gone. Well, let's get you over to England, from Halifax oh. to England, right. aboard a, uh, a reconstructed luxury liner, right, That's called right. the Elle de France. That's right, the de France, uh -huh. which uh, the uh, British had taken over. Our crew was uh, a British crew, a few Canadians, and there were 15,000, as I heard, understood, troops aboard that ship when we left on on uh, Valentine's Day of February 44. And uh, uh, it took us seven days. Right. Zigzagging, I suppose. Of right. course, rumors abounded. We'd been sunk, we'd been fallen, we'd been all these sorts of things. Right. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was crewed by the British. Yeah. And the food was horrible. Yeah, oh, you bet. <laughs> Had navy beans for breakfast and uh, kidneys and I don't know what, a liver probably. And these, I'm telling you, I was 20 years old and I felt like I was a senior to these kids. Yeah, they and, were young kids, weren't right, they? Right, they were young. And they had, they had the spirit. Okay. They had the morale. You talked about a young corporal in a speech that right. he made. Right, I'll tell you if I can remember it, but he, we had these little tent movies. He got up on the stage and he did it more than once. He recited Billy Rose's poem, The Unknown Soldier. Mm -hmm. And he said, the last verse, says, I am the unknown soldier, and maybe I died in vain, but if my country call, if I were alive and my country called, I would do it all over again. And boy, they cheered, oh, they and they had him do it again. Yes. <laughs> it's amazing how those, those snapshots in your mind will, yeah. will, will stay there. Another thing. Yes, sir. They had music, and old Texas Jim Robinson was singing, I'd love to be in Texas for the roundup in the spring. <laughs> that was the other side. <laughs> I know the young Calvin Boykin, right. and also the uh, the patch of your, your unit. So yeah. when, when was that picture taken? Uh, that was taken while I was at North Camp Hood. Right. And uh, the patch, shoulder patch, is the tank destroyer. Of the 7th Army? Uh, the, yeah, the tank, uh, uh, the Tiger, or the panther mm -hmm. crushing the tank in his jaw. Crushing the tank. Now, the uh, Seventh Armored, we were attached to them after we landed in Normandy. Right. right. You are uh, there on the, on the left, on yeah. your uh, sort of kneeled over. With the, my the mess kit, as usual, you know. Right, right, right. And that was in uh, Birmingham or in Packenden Park. That was early. Right. And, right. As you were uh, preparing to, uh, to right. move across the English right. Channel. Uh, you're married to Rosemary. As a matter of fact, uh, you, uh, July the 1st, I believe, you had been married uh, 61 years. And uh, just talk very quickly about uh, your family. I know you have four children. Right. Well, we have uh, four children mm -hmm. and uh, seven grandchildren. Right. And some and, great grandchildren. Right? And uh, four great grandchildren. Wow. And uh, so we've covered the waterfront. Indeed. Indeed and you if have. you look at some of these, one of these books is What If? I say, What if that anti tank gun? had been just a hair more, none of this would have exi oh, existed. exactly. Just what if. Exactly. You know? And we think about those things. You think about the generations that would right. not have been. A whole generation. Had things have gone right. somewhat differently. Right. Of course, we know, I know that Rosemary uh, has published herself a history of the Brazos Valley Italians. That's from right. Her, right. From her heritage. And so she worked hard she's... getting that uh, historical, state historical marker uh -huh. out down there at Steel Store. Right. And uh, then she'd written her family history from Sicily to Texas. Right. Well, history is in your family's blood because I know one of your daughters, Anne, works for the uh, City of College right. Station and she's right. been the, the founder of the Project Hold right. uh, that is uh, so meaningful to the City right. of College Station. And she loves that history and she remembers. She remembers things I didn't know happened. But right. <laughs> That was uh, recorded on uh, June the 7th, 2007, and Calvin died the next year in 2008. Next, uh, Yolanda Kozlowski. Uh, she and her husband, we actually did a separate show with both she and her husband. This is from the show that we did uh, just with her, and this was, uh, she was a triage nurse uh, following Patton's army in Europe. And uh, this was recorded May the 3rd of 2007. 
Captain Yolanda Kozlowski witnessed much of World War II working under a Red Cross tent, a triage nurse for the 100th Evacuation Hospital, attached to General Patton's Third Army, marching through France and Belgium onto Germany. Her memories of the war are those of good times and the saddest times. One of those good times was when then Yolanda Frisch met the young aviator, Ed Kozlowski, four days after D-Day. That was a meeting that resulted in what has now been a 60-year marriage. We welcome Captain Yolanda Kozlowski to Veterans of the Valley. Welcome, Yolanda, and thank you first off for your service. Let's go back to uh, when you uh, first decided to get into the uh, military and get into the service, and it was something that your father was not real in favor of, so you had to sort of make him a promise, but eventually you got into the service. Sort of take us back to that time. Well, I promised my father. I talked to him about joining the Army, and he said, he wanted me to wait one year mm -hmm. to make sure that that's what I wanted to do. So I be became a superintendent of nurses for a hospital in Charleston, West Virginia. Right. I worked a year, and I still hadn't changed my mind. And I went to the Army and applied to get into the Army. Right. And I was told in a nice way that I had only limited service in the United States. Right, you had flat feet. Yes, I had flat feet and I had an eyesight deficiency. And uh, so I said, well, okay, I'll take that chance. And I was assigned to Fletcher General Hospital in Cambridge, Ohio. Right. And That was an assignment you didn't like very much. Well, I was very upset, <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly. <laughs> anyway, uh, I went into the Army at the time they were changing from blues to khaki. Mm -hmm. And of course, the Army said, we will furnish you with everything you need. So I waited for the Army to furnish me. And in, in the meantime, I wore civilian clothes, which did not set very well with the superintendent of nurses at Fletcher General. And she kept asking me if I was going to buy it. And I said, no, that the Army said they would furnish me everything. And I said, I'm waiting till they furnish me everything I need. <laughs> and finally, I broke down and did buy some of things. But, uh, at that time, they were changing from blue to cracky, so I didn't want to invest a whole lot of money into blue, which I wouldn't use again. Right. And uh, so finally, we got into the khakis. And I was assigned to Fletcher General Hospital, which made me very unhappy. And uh, so I decided, well, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> and I didn't exactly break rules, but I bent them. Right. And uh, of course, after I bent several rules, the uh, chief nurse decided that I should be put on a detail, that, uh, a group that was going to uh, Camp Dix. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, so we went there, and I was assigned to the 100th Evac, which right. was what I wanted to do anyway. And I was going overseas. That was your ticket overseas. And we kept saying, please, let us go to Europe. Uh -huh. Don't go to... Pacific. Let's go to Europe. And everyone was there because nobody knew exactly where we were going to go until we were on the water. Right. And then they opened the, the orders and that's where we went. Yeah. And of course we had winter clothes and summer clothes and so we were pre prepared for both places. We landed at Swansea, England mm -hmm. on February the 14th. Right. And from there we went to Fleetwood, England and our unit, which consists of over 300 people, the hospital there was assigned to a hospital, I mean to a hotel, and they also had places for the enlisted people, which they lived in uh, an area where the fishermen came in and out. And uh, so we were told that we should prepare for D-Day. Right. And yeah. as we did, we spent our time, which seems probably funny to people now, but we spent our time making packages of gauze mm -hmm. and rollers of bandages and so forth and putting them in trunks that we could have at each um, area. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we did this for our spare time. And plus that time, uh, we were allowed to go off on weekends. And I took every weekend off and went somewhere in England. Right. And of course, my chief nurse said to me, where are you going? I said, I really don't know. I'm going to get on the train and go somewhere. Uh -huh. And she said, well, don't you think that's a little not thing, the thing to do? Right, and right. I said, but well, you wanted to see the country, right? I said, well, I may never get a chance to be in England again, so I'm going everywhere I possibly can. And so she didn't 
uh, fuss and fume too much after that. She let, sort of let me go. Right. But uh, I had to have permission from her to go on these weekend trips. Right. I know one of your problems that you had is you, you had a roommate that uh, had a little bit of a drinking problem, you said, so you didn't want to hang around a whole lot. Plus, you wanted to, this would be your only chance to, to see, see the England. country of England. Yes, so you... I had a roommate that really was an alcoholic. Right. And there's no ifs and ands about it. And uh -huh. I really didn't want to spend a weekend with her. Exactly. And uh, so for that reason, I got every weekend I possibly could. Right, right. So much of your time in England, and this is very important that I don't think a lot of people realize, so much of your time in England was spent preparing for what you were going to do, and that was to, to go uh, over, after D-Day. Right, go yes. after D-Day and to uh, and to to take care of the wounded. of the of the wounded and the soldiers, and a lot of that was was preparing the the supplies, how they would have to go, because you don't just create a hospital, you don't just get there and the hospital's all ready to go. You all had you, to build we, it from the, we from had the bottom to, up. We had to make sure that we had everything that we possibly could think of mm -hmm. that we would put in this trunk, right. so that we. We couldn't go to the corner store and say, well, give me a bandage. <laughs> right. Yolanda, the 100th Evacuation Hospital was a unit attached to Patton's 3rd Army. Army. And you did have occasion to, uh, to meet General Patton, uh, obviously probably one of the most famous and recognizable figures of, uh, of all uh, of American history. Uh, he, was a, he was a rough old bird, just like he's characterized in the history books, right? Yes, he was, but he knew, he knew warfare, mm -hmm. and he knew exactly where to go and what to do about it, and he did. He planned extremely well. Right. He was probably one of the best people that we ever had in war mm -hmm. that planned accordingly to what was necessary. Right, right. And he was a very rough man, uh -huh. but I think he was a very good man. Right. He was fair. Yes. Sometimes not nice. Not nice, but, but he you, was fair. That's right. <laughs> right. <laughs> but you can't lead, lead an no. army and be nice. That's right. right. Um, you, uh, your, your hospitals, the 100th uh, evacuation, sort of characterized that. I know there was surgery, there was medical, there was also psychiatric care, and you were a triage nurse. Yes. So sort of give us a, a, an idea of what these particular moving hospitals were like and what your particular job was. Well, being a triage nurse, you have to define whether or not this person is acutely ill mm -hmm. or whether he needs surgery immediately or whether he can go back to, uh, to combat. Mm -hmm. And what you do as a triage nurse, the people that can go back to combat are treated first. Right, right. Which, which you, is very difficult. Which is very difficult sometimes because sometimes you had to treat the, the, the less severely wounded because then, they could get on their feet quicker and go back to combat. That, and sometimes the more severely wounded had to wait. wait, wait. And you tried to, you tried to save as many seriously wounded as you possibly could. Right. But your hands were tied in many ways because you only, you only had so much space in a tent and you only had two people attending these people. Right. And that probably was about for 60 people. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you couldn't do everything that you really wanted to do. Right. I mean, you did the best that you could and you tried as hard as you could. Right. That is a picture that I found of a young Yolanda Frisch. About how old were you in that picture? 25. 25 years old. And that was taken when? Before you went, went overseas? That probably was, recall? no, that was taken in England. In England. Mm hmm Okay. Mm hmm Okay. Let's move on. What are we looking this at there? Was, You're on the left, obviously. Yes. This was... This was an, uh, well, I just, I have to laugh at it because this was someone that just came in and had a, a slight wound and we were treating him and they took, this photographer took this picture of that and that was it. Yeah. It was one of those kind of things that you said, well, I don't really need this. <laughs> <laughs> By the looks on the face, it doesn't look like a real serious situation. It, right? it, was, it was not yeah, a serious was, situation at all. That was one of those that you just bandaged up and said, get on back out there. So. Yeah, we said, you're, you're, you're done, go. <laughs> <laughs> you're done, go, okay. Let's move on to the next picture. It's uh, oh, this was Christmas of 1944. This, yeah, mm -hmm. and that's Greenberg. That was one of my teammates. Right. And we made oh, we all made snowmen. We thought, why not celebrate? Uh huh. And we got through making all these snowmen and so forth, and we moved the day before Christmas. I see. People uh, talk when they talk about the Battle of the Bulge, which was this time. Uh, they talk about how cold it was. So there's sort of an, an it idea was cold. of uh, we had what a, the terrain was like. We had a a pot-bellied stove in each tent, right. and we were allowed one brick a week. Uh -huh. 
and this, I mean, one brick a week, which was four bricks for us. Right. And we would save it all at one time and make fudge. Oh, okay. <laughs> well. That's, that's resourceful. Okay. That's right. Let's move on to the, uh, the next picture. Oh, this is Greenberg and I were rolling up our... Um, your, uh, your, your sleeping, sleeping bag. bag mm -hmm. Yeah. And of course, you know, with your sleeping bag, it was your luggage. It was everything that you had. Everything that you had, you put in your sleeping bag. Right. And they look at them and they say, they're big. And I said, well, we had to put all our clothes in there. All our shoes, everything else went in there. So that's why they were not a small bag. No. I still have one. It was a two-person job to roll yeah. that up, obviously. Yeah, I still have mine. That's right. Yolanda uh, and her husband, Ed, uh, they were both uh, a, a delight. Um, that was in 07. Uh, Yolanda passed away in 2014, 10 years ago. Uh, next, uh, Colonel Bob Wilkinson. This was recorded uh, August the 30th of 2006. And um, it's not really a story about his combat or about his service in the war, well it is about his service as a matter of fact, but not any combat service, but a, uh, a special job that he had and a very interesting job that he had. And I'll let him tell you about it. Colonel Bob Wilkinson caught the end of the Korean War and then three tours of Vietnam, flying both fixed wing and choppers as a United States Marine. But some of his most memorable stories come from the 32 weeks that he served as a helicopter pilot for President and Mrs. Dwight Eisenhower in those 32 weeks, he was shuttling them, mostly from the White House to the retreat named after their grandson. That was Camp David. His is a fascinating 28-year career of military service, and we welcome Bobby Wilkinson of Bryan to Veterans of the Valley. The Marine Corps decided to send 60% of the aviators into helicopters because that was the coming thing. And uh, I received orders to Pensacola and retrain in helicopters and reported to the West Coast. And I'd been on the West Coast about a year, and I was on maneuvers in the Philippines, and all of a sudden I get orders to report to Washington, D.C. And uh, uh, immediately, and also during my uh, time and route, I was supposed to work up uh, so I could get clearance for a White House clearance. So I knew that something was up, and we'd heard rumors <laughs> that they were starting to going to start a program to fly the president by, by helicopter. helicopters. And that's when I reported into Quantico, which is where we were based at. And we'd fly from there up the river. And, it, and uh, Ike had a very strict schedule. He, uh, you could set your watch on his timing. Yes, sir. <laughs> we would uh, go in to pick him up if we were set, had a set time to pick him up at the White House we could be 21 seconds early or three seconds late. <laughs> and he had heard that real well. And on the first 32 weekends that I was at Quantico, I would go up on a Friday afternoon, pick the president and Mrs. Eisenhower up on a Friday and take them up to Camp David mm -hmm. and stay up there for the weekend. They were always scheduled to fly back on a Sunday afternoon but it would never happen. Right. Mamie didn't like to fly, but she would fly to get out of Washington. Uh -huh. But when it come time for her to uh, return to Washington, usually on a Sunday afternoon, she would call us and apologize for the fact that she was going to stay over till Monday morning and the president would too, and we were flying back at 7 o'clock <laughs> in the morning on Monday morning, and then she would always invite us down to have dinner with her and the president. Right. In uh, the cabin they lived in at uh, Camp David, which was called Aspen. Yes, sir. And a uh, very nice meal, and we all, always had all 15 members of our crews. We had five helicopters up there. And after the f dinner, they would make sure we stayed for the movie. Hollywood knew that Eisenhower enjoyed Western movies, so they flew the latest Western movies out to him. Right. And uh, he, uh, we had a big L-shaped room off the dining room, and at the back of the room was three couches and a table and then a 35-millimeter projector on top of it. 
and out in the middle of the room there would be one chair and one chair only. That's where Ike sat. Yes, sir. And at the other end was a pull-down screen. So we'd get up from the table, and when we got up from the table, dining room table, Mamie would make sure she had grabbed one of us by one arm and one by the other and set us down on the couch so she'd have a person on each side to talk to. Mm -hmm. And during the movie, she didn't ever watch the movie at all. She'd be talking. And every once in a while, it usually happened about three times during the movie, the president would turn over his shoulder and say, Mamie, she hush, I can't hear the movie. <laughs> and that would Just happen. like regular folks, right? Just like regular <laughs> folks. And that happened for the 32 straight weekends. And to be honest with you, I've never seen the same movie twice. There's always... Yeah, Bobby Wilkinson, he was, uh, he was quite a character. That was uh, recorded in 06. Uh, Colonel Wilkinson passed away in 2021. Um, R.F. Sonny Franzi, uh, his job in World War II in Europe was uh, to set telephone poles, communication. That was his job. Uh, but it was what happened after VE Day that was burned in his memory, and for very good reason. And here's uh, R.F. Sonny Franzi. Certainly we hear that we're losing our World War II veterans. A thousand a day, they say. But there are many who treat their senior years like prime years. And one of those is R.F. Sonny Franzi of Bryan. A native of the farm that he grew up on near Curtin, today Sonny Franzi remains active. Whether it's tending to his extensive collection of barbed wire, guns, or nutcrackers, or just telling the remarkable story of leaving the farm and going into the Army, learning to climb telephone poles and set communication wire and eventually taking that training across the North Atlantic to the front lines of Europe, landing at Normandy on D plus 10. The bravery that led to five bronze stars and the horror his unit discovered at the concentration camp called Buchenwald. Sonny Franzi, welcome. Thank, Thank you for being here. Thank you. A young kid growing up on the farm near Curtin and all of a sudden they yank you off the farm and they put you in the army. That had to be quite a culture shock, I would think. Well, it really was. I was, uh, literally uh, uh, drafted off the, out of the cotton patch in uh, September of 1942. I never traveled uh, much, but that soon changed with uh, my first trip to uh, uh, Houston for my physical and to be inducted into the uh, service. Then back to Bryan and two weeks later uh, on a bus to uh, Fort Sam Houston in uh, San Antonio. And I was uh, uh, going to be a, a pole lineman. They sent me out with a pair of spurs to climb, learn to climb poles. Well, I'd always been a climber. I'd climbed everything. I, from little on, mostly trees to shake out a possum. But <laughs> <laughs> Telephone pole was a different thing. <laughs> uh, this, this was different, especially with the uh, old dull spurs they, they gave us. But, uh, but let's move along to after uh, VE Day, the war is over in Europe, and you and your unit come across the concentration camp at Buchenwald. This is obviously something, an experience that you will never forget. And talk about that a little bit, and then we're going to show some photographs. Oh, uh, the, uh, uh, after the war was uh, practically over, uh, they sent us to uh, far east uh, Germany at, at Weimar, and uh, there's where, as we uh, approached the uh, uh, area, we saw the smoke rising and everything. Of course, didn't know exactly what it was at that time, but we got settled in, and the, uh, in a couple of days, we uh, went up to uh, uh, to this camp to the it proved to be a uh, Buchenwald concentration camp, mm -hmm. and. Uh, there we, uh, as we uh, went up to the camp along this uh, tree-lined lane, uh, there were bodies all along the way. And people that had, uh, uh, when the Germans evacuated the place, they, all the inmates that were there tried to run, and uh, a lot of them were so weak they, they didn't make it, they right. died on the way. Right. Interesting uh, postscript to that. Uh, Sonny ha had lots of pictures uh, that he had taken, and you can imagine the, the nature of the, of the photographs. Uh, I'm sure in your history classes and in your lives you've seen some of the 
horror pictures from uh, the camps. And the decision was made not to include those on the show uh, just because of the nature of the pictures. And Sonny didn't like that. He was upset with us. He, and I could see his point. He, he wanted the realness of it for people to see. Uh, but we had to make that decision. But that was just kind of an interesting situation. I mean, he wasn't angry, angry. I think he was just uh, disappointed that we hadn't shown the, uh, the photographs. But uh, quite a gentleman and quite a story. Uh, that was uh, taped in 05, and Sonny passed away in 2014. <clears throat> who, uh, who saw the movie, the original movie, uh, the first Jaws movie of Jaws? Remember the character Quint? played by Robert Shaw, the actor. Remember how he uh, got the scar on his leg? Yeah. Hmm? How? Um, his ship was bombed or something like that mm -hmm. in the water. What was the name of the ship? Okay, now we're going Thank you. The USS Indianapolis. Okay. That was Hollywood. I want you to meet Glenn Morgan, and this is real. He was a bugler on the USS Indianapolis. Hello and welcome to Veterans of the Valley. I'm Tom Turbeville. It was July the 30th, 1945. The USS Indianapolis, the flagship of the 5th Fleet, had just four days earlier completed the most important and secretive mission of World War II, the delivery to Tinian Island of the most significant elements of the atomic bomb, which seven days later would destroy Hiroshima forcing Japan's surrender and ending the war. But just past midnight on that late July day, many lives changed and many more were lost when a Japanese I-58 submarine under the order of Lieutenant Commander Michitsura Hashimoto fired six torpedoes from a range of 1,500 meters. In just 12 minutes, the Indianapolis was sunk with its crew of 1,157 sailors and 39 Marines. 900 made it into the water before the ship went under. The rest drowned or perished in the explosion. For four days and five nights, they floated on rafts in the Pacific waters midway between Guam and the Leyte Gulf. By the time the rescue planes found them, nearly 600 of those 900 had died, some from exposure, most from shark attack. Just 317 were rescued, 92 of those survived today. Glenn D. Morgan of Camp Creek was one of the captain's telephone operators and one of the buglers aboard the USS Indianapolis, and we welcome him here today. Glenn Morgan, it is a pleasure to uh, be with you and to see you. Let's take it back from July the 30th and talk about the mission itself. You all had this crate on board the USS Indianapolis. It was a crate that obviously uh, caused a, a lot of uh, consternation. You didn't know exactly what it was, but you knew it had to do with your mission. We didn't know what it was. We knew it was very important. They loaded it, put it in the uh, port hangar, and there it stayed until we delivered it uh, to Tinian. But we had no idea what it was, of course, but we knew it was very important. They put marine guards on it and allowed nobody to get close to it. Right. I walked by it each day, and we started a lot of rumors. Uh, it's one thing we like to do aboard ship, was start rumors. So I started one that uh, I thought it was the paperwork and all the maps that, you know, they were going to have to have to, for the invasion of Japan. That flew pretty good until somebody started the rumor that it was nothing but scented toilet paper for MacArthur. And, uh, but yes, the, uh, we knew it was important. Now, the uranium uh, they put forward in a area I, I had no idea where that was. Right, right. But it was very, very important. So that's what we did. We headed out on a high-speed run to Tinian. Right, right. So your bomb. mission was accomplished. Yeah. And uh, the delivery of what turned out to be the atomic bomb uh, was made. But then uh, July the 30th, about 10 minutes after midnight, the day had just started. Talk a little bit about uh, what, where you were and, and what happened at that time. Well, I stood all my watches on the bridge and during general quarters, well, I always had to man these JL telephone circuits. And we always had uh, signals come, uh, 
conversations coming in from all over the ship, and I was to report them to the captain. But on that night, I had served my time on watch, and I had a housekeeping cleaning area, and it was conning tower, and this was where they would take the bridge, and you would go down below into conning tower, and they could steer the ship and do everything they could do on the bridge. And this is where I was sleeping and a friend of mine, and we slept on the deck on a mattress cover with a uh, little life belt uh, that you blew up with air, and we were using those for pillows mm -hmm. when this terrific explosion uh, occurred. Let's go ahead, and uh, if we're ready, let's go ahead and take a look at the USS Indianapolis. We've got a photograph here, and uh, we'll be able to tell you there is, uh, there's the Indianapolis right there. And from what I understand from what you've told me, you were situated somewhere right around right, in there. right around there right right there at the front yep okay that but that's the uh that's the indianapolis that's the uh cruiser right 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 it was a heavy cruiser about 610 feet long but it was an old cruiser but uh, admiral spruance was always aboard uh, generally right and it was very high speed and that's one thing you liked about it and that's what we were doing was about 33 knots across the uh, well, to Pearl Harbor, where we fueled up. The night that this happened, I say I was sleeping on the deck. My good friend there, we jumped up. I looked at my watch, and it said uh, 10 minutes after midnight. So Ralph, my friend, said, why don't we go to the bridge, which we did. We climbed up the ladder and got on the bridge, and... Uh, we decided this thing right then was not in very good shape because it was already listing to about 45 degrees. So we went aft to get a life jacket. We, all of our life jackets were strung on a wire behind the chart house. Chart house set right in the middle of the bridge. None there already, they were gone. So by the time we got to the forward part of the bridge, the deck was inclined to about 45 degrees only two other people were there, the bugler of the watch and the, the uh, officer of the deck, uh, mm -hmm. Lieutenant Orr. So I asked him, I said, is there anything we're supposed to do? What happened? Uh, he didn't know for sure, thought we got torpedoed. But they'd already abandoned, uh, passed the word to abandon ship. So uh, my good friend and I decided to stick together. And I asked the bugler if he was going to sound abandoned ship, and he said, well, as soon as I get the order. He never got them. He never sounded abandoned ship. It wasn't necessary, really, of course. But I told Lieutenant Orr goodbye, told him I'd see him later, and crawled over the railing because that was the shortest way I knew to get to the water. My good friend did not follow me. He thought that was pretty stupid, I guess. But when I got down to the next deck, I slid down the side and jumped down to the next deck. Then I slid down the side of the ship until I got into the 40 millimeter gun mounts, and that's where the water swept me up against the gun. My little life belt sort of buoyed me up a little bit. The ship began to go down, and the gun barrels by this time were sitting straight up in the air, and I went right up one of those Actually, I didn't go up it. The gun went down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there I was, free of the ship, and I swam away. And you swam hard, and uh, you, you found a plane floating in the water. I looked around and watched the ship sink, and the screws were still turning, and the thing was, the uh, stern was high in the air. And then I thought, well, I better see what's happening here. And when I looked around, I could see way back. You, it was light enough that you could see a little bit. But I could see the silhouette of an airplane, and uh, it was quite a ways back. So being the good swimmer that I was, I Australian crawled back to that bed as fast as I could. The plane was sinking, but there was a life raft, and I crawled in that life raft. There was another life raft. I tied it together, and heads popped up, and people crawled in the life raft. And nobody knew anybody. You couldn't tell who it was. We swam through fuel oil, and it was all over us. And finally, everything got quiet, and the calls for help subsided. They, uh, 
look, we looked out and there was a little black blurb over there uh, on the water and we hollered and they hollered back and we found that there were two more life rafts. They were lobbed on top of each other. And so consequently we uh, got all four of those together and tied them together and there we had four, four life rafts strung out and tied together two or three feet apart. And uh, I looked at my watch and I know that the thing was very loosey-goosey. In fact, if you picked it up, it'd fall apart. So I know it stopped at 20 minutes after. So I was 20 minutes, 10 minutes had elapsed since I looked at my watch and hit the water, apparently. So when the ship sank and they say 12 minutes, they were pretty close. Exactly. I want to give people an idea when you talk about the life raft, sort of what we're talking about. Yeah, because right. Uh, in a recent reunion, you were able to actually see almost an exact replica of right. that uh, life raft. And we have a photograph of not the one you were in, but uh, this is pretty much uh, uh, the kind of life raft that you're talking about. It's, I guess it's made of uh, wood mainly, right, the, what you were sitting on. Is Somebody that right? told me it was balls of wood. I never really found out. But it, it, you can see that it's covered with uh, uh, lacing of uh, canvas and painted very heavily. You had found two of these, and then... You found another group, and there were two more, two more, and you all strapped together in sort of a right. big rectangle for right. four life rafts, and there were, what, 19 or 20 of you? We started there. with 20, mm -hmm. and uh, we had a Lieutenant Freeze that looked like he just had a severe sunburn, but unfortunately, uh, we didn't realize it, but Lieutenant Freeze, uh, he talked. He never said he was hurt or anything, but sometime during that first night, uh, he passed away. And the fellows in his raft took his ring and his watch, and uh, there wasn't anything he could do but just slip him over, and we all gave a little prayer to him, and, and uh, that was the end of Mr. Freeze. I found it interesting, Glenn, that uh, the, those who, who made it into the water, who survived that, you were spread out over a 50-square-mile area, right. 10 miles by 5 miles. Right. So. With the swales and the way the Pacific Ocean was, its own character, for four days, you had no idea that you all on those four rafts, you, the 20 of you, were not the only survivors of the Indianapolis. That's certainly true. The next morning, the waves were white capping, and uh, you looked around, and there was not another soul. There was no debris, nothing. And uh, I started to go after a piece of... Uh, I thought it was pyrotechnics from the other raft, and uh, somebody said, well, you better not look out there, and that was the first time I'd ever thought of sharks. And there was this classic picture, you see, of a shark fin going through the water. And I decided that was not prudent to go after that. It was just sailing away. It was blowing away like a sailboat, a canister. But I didn't go after it, and apparently we didn't need it. So. That was the end of my excursion after that thing <laughs> with a raft with a shark out there. But actually, uh, we made it pretty good. We were probably one of the best equipped group outside of the captain. Uh, he had four life rafts. Right. But as the days went on and everybody got aggravated and we couldn't understand why we weren't rescued, and uh, occasionally we would see an airplane way away. And Finally, we decided we better see if uh, we thought we weren't going to get picked up. And I thought, well, I'll try fishing. So I tried this little fishing kit. The Navy did not have a very good fishing kit. It was nothing but a white rag with some hooks stuck in it, some colored yarn, and a piece of bacon rind. Fish didn't like any of that. So I quit. But my good friend over in the other raft, I didn't know the fella, but I looked over and there he was. We'd rationed the water and everything. Yeah. We had spam. And we well, rationed. Like three ounces of water a day, right? Yeah, we had three ounces of water. I think we had three ounces. There was some argument on this, but I remember, I think I remember better than anybody. Right. But uh, we had three ounces in the morning and three ounces in the afternoon. And we had little cups that had little ounce marks in them. So they, Set these up pretty good, but uh, we didn't ration malt tablets. And so as I looked over this other raft, here was this guy laying down with his arm up on the edge of the raft, laying in the water with a dip net in his hand, a 
you just pull it apart. He would sit there like this in a little, he'd spit these malt, malt tablets in the water. And in between the rafts, they would come and go, and it was a little calmer in between. And there was a little purple fish that would come up. And this guy would sit there with this little net, and just about the time that fish would grab that malt tablet, he would make a pass at it with this little dip net. And I watched this going on for a while, and I finally I said, or crying out loud, I said, you're never going to catch that fish. And he said, well, what else have I got to do? And I thought, well, that made sense. And sure enough, he did catch that fish. So what turned out to be a good friend a little bit later, took his knife and cut that little purple fish up. And this guy used that for bait, and he caught the prettiest silver fish about this long, bluish silver. I don't know what kind they were. But he cleaned these things, this fellow cleaned them with us, and then filleted them and laid this nice white meat on the side of the raft. And most of us took a piece of it just to see, because we didn't really know how long we were going to be out there. But right. now we knew that we could catch fish. On the, the, the piece of papers that you have, you have a, a website that you can go and see any of these shows in their entirety. And I urge you to, to see the, the shows with, uh, with Glenn Morgan. It's, uh, it's pretty amazing. I've seen the show several times, obviously. I was there, but uh, I'm sorry, looking at it again, the only thing I can't get over is that comb over. Oh my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I told you, you're gonna see all kind of hairlines in this. Um, Glenn Morgan was a really, really good friend. He was a bugler until the day he died. I know he did a lot of, uh, uh, he played taps at a lot of military funerals uh, here in Bryan College Station. And he had a little jazz band and uh, just quite a delightful uh, gentleman. Uh, he passed away in 2012. <clears throat> Final one uh, is Bob Pardo. Bob just passed away in December, December the 5th. And uh, any of y'all know Bob? You know about Pardo's push? push yeah. Airplane. Well, you're going to hear all about it. Uh, Google sometime, Pardo's Push. And uh, it was one of the most famous, amazing uh, combat aeronautical feats ever. As a matter of fact, the TV show JAG actually did a, an episode inspired by what Bob Pardo did. Uh, Bob lived in Pebble Creek, uh, played golf almost until the day he died, and uh, he was quite a gentleman, really was. And uh, so, meet Bob Pardo. It was the height of the Vietnam War, and the North Vietnamese government treasured its only steel mill, located just north of Hanoi. A half dozen surface-to-air missiles and more than a thousand anti-aircraft guns protected it. But it was the 433rd's mission to destroy it, March the 10th, 1967. Then Captain Bob Pardo and Captain Earl Amon, each piloting F-4 Phantoms, with their backseaters, Steve Wayne and Robert Houghton. Little did they know that that day they would make military aviation history. Ask any military flyer about Pardo's push, and they still marvel at the unbelievable story of how four airmen survived against the longest odds. Now retired, Lieutenant Colonel Bob Pardo lives with his wife, Catherine, in College Station. And what a story he has to tell. Uh, strike force consisted of uh about 40 strike aircraft, uh, F-105s and F-4s. Our flight was the last formation in the strike force. Um, as we approached the target, about 40 miles north, Earl Amon, who was the number four man in our flight, was hit by an aircraft fire. A uh, few lights came on, warning lights came on, but uh, as he proceeded, uh, the lights started to go back up, systems recovered. The airplane was flying uh, very well. And so there was, uh, he and his backseater, Bob Houghton, talked it over and decided that it would be fine if they continued the mission. Um, so we continued on down towards the target. We were forced to fly lower than ordinary mm -hmm. so that when we did arrive at the target, uh, we had to climb several thousand feet to get to our roll-in altitude for the bomb run. 
Just as the formation rolled in on the target, uh, Earl got hit again. Since he was directly over the target, uh, he saw no reason why he shouldn't continue. Go ahead and put his bombs on the target with everybody else. Actually, after they were hit the first time, mm -hmm. uh, he and Bob talked it over, and they decided that uh, they would say a little prayer. So they swapped flying the airplane. One guy would fly while the other one prayed. Uh, then they'd change control, and the other guy would have his, his little prayer. And as I said, uh, rolling in on the target, he got hit, and so uh, he decided to continue. He could have left then also, but he decided to continue with the bomb run. Pulling off the target, Steve and I were hit pretty heavy. Um, but the main thing at that point is simply to keep the formation together and head outbound. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing we do after coming off the target is, is get off of the strike frequency uh, to reduce congestion on the air. Uh, get a fuel check and a battle damage check. When we got the fuel check, we have a certain amount of gas that we need at the target in order to make it back to the base. We have another number that we use to determine if we can get back to the refueling tanker. Right. And for our purposes that day, uh, 7,000 pounds of fuel was required to make it back to the base, 5,000 pounds to make it to the tanker. As our flight checked in, giving our fuel status to the flight leader, um, I was 2,000 pounds short of gas, which indicated that I at least might be able to make it to the tanker. But Earl was uh, short 5,000 pounds. He was, he was down to only 2,000 pounds remaining. That 2,000 pounds in a Phantom would not get him out of North Vietnam, much less to the tanker. About how many minutes of flying time is that? Uh, 2,000 pounds. Maybe, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. Not much. Not much. No. Um, so it became obvious that he was not going to make it out of North Vietnam. Well, in the, in the flatlands up there, uh, if you go down, you basically have two different things that are going to happen. If the civilians captured you, they would probably kill you on the spot. If you were captured by the militia or the active military, right. uh, you were going to prison. Neither of which is a very good uh, option. Certainly not. So while we were outbound, uh, Earl was having trouble keeping up with the formation. And so I started to lag behind and stay with him, uh, just in case the MiGs came after us for a revenge kill on the way out. I still had missiles on board and uh, significantly more fuel than he had, but uh, they didn't attack, so we simply flew uh, southwest until we crossed the Red River. As soon as you cross the Red River outbound uh, to the west, uh, things start getting better very quickly. Uh, fewer guns, uh, hardly any missiles, and so it, Earl felt that it was safe to climb. He wanted to climb as high as possible uh, so that when he flamed out, he could glide as far as he could. I want to stop you right there, and I want to show a picture of, uh, of uh, young Captain Bob Pardo and uh, Captain Wayne here that we have ready. This is a, a photograph that was... Uh, Taken. Uh, w when was was this taken? Was this taken uh, before this date or after this date? When was this taken? Do you recall? I think it was taken uh, a couple of weeks before. Uh, we had the squadron together for a class picture, you know, and mm -hmm. and while they were doing that, they let each individual crew uh, have a picture made at the same time. And you're standing in front of an F4, is that right? Yes. So there you go. You can. Uh, the uh, the standard load on the on the airplanes on a bombing mission would be the huge tank you can see under the center of the airplane, 600 right. gallons of fuel, and then on the inboard pylons, uh, six 750-pound bombs. Okay. Continue the story. I think you left off. Earl had gone high so that, uh, so that if when he... When he flamed out, right. he'd, he would uh, have maximum glide distance. Well, while we were climbing up to, to altitude, he had jettisoned everything off of his airplane that he could get rid of. Uh, bomb racks, pylons, everything to reduce the drag. I had done the same thing except my centerline tank wouldn't jettison. 
Um, ordinarily, we jettison it inbound as soon as it's out of fuel just to get rid of the drag, but uh, my tank wouldn't jettison, so I still had it. Um, we were looking at his airplane over, and I'm, I'm thinking, the airplane is flying fine. He has perfect control of the airplane. He's simply going to run out of gas. And, and I th thought, there's got to be something we can do to get him to the jungle and out of the, the flatlands here. And it occurred to me that perhaps if he would jettison the drag chute, which is right on the tail end of the airplane, that I could put the nose of my airplane into the drag chute compartment and push. We attempted that, but uh, the turbulence coming off of his airplane was so great that when we got within about three feet of him, uh, it was just throwing us all over the sky. So we had to abandon that. Right. We backed uh, away from him, dropped down underneath his airplane, and uh, tried to put the top of our fuselage up against the belly of his airplane. And as we got within about a foot of his air airplane, we could feel a, a vacuum or a suction pulling our airplane up against his. It had become obvious to Steve and I that we weren't going to make it either, that uh, we were losing fuel apparently from battle damage. Yes. And uh, that we were not going to make it and we were going to have to eject. So we didn't want to damage the, the canopies and possibly not be able to eject. So we backed away once more and, and we just sat beneath his airplane about like that. Fighter pilots can't talk without using their hands. Right. Uh, <laughs> and we're, we're looking up at the bottom of his airplane. And of course the F-4 was originally designed for the Navy for use on carriers as fleet defense. So it's equipped with a tail hook for carrier landings. Right. Well, the Air Force retained the tail hook when we bought the airplane uh, so that we could put a resting gear on our runways. And if you came back to land with a, an emergency, the fire truck could park in one spot, and that's where you were going to be after you took the barrier. Well, I'm looking at the tail hook, and I thought, well, it's about six feet long, and it sticks down about a 45 degree angle below the airplane, gets us. Uh, down below it pretty good and I told Earl to drop the tail hook and uh, about this all happened about the same time he's he's running out of gas very fast and there's only about 200 pounds left and I said just go ahead and shut it down get rid of the jet wash and then we were able to move in put his tail hook in the middle of our windshield so he, he's a glider at he is this now, time. When, he is now flying you know the world's heaviest glider. About what speed were you going before he shut down the engine? Well, best, best glide speed for the airplane is 250 knots. So that's, that's how fast we were going. Um, once he flamed out, the rate of descent uh, for the Phantom is about 3,000 feet a minute. Right. So from 36,000 feet, we just had over 10 minutes and we were going to be in the, in the jungle. Okay, so the tail hook is deployed. And we eased up very slowly, very gently put it in the middle of the windshield, started adding power, and the vertical speed reduced to about 1,500 feet a minute. That essentially told us that we were going to double his glide distance, and uh, we, could, we could see that we were going to make it into the jungle. So I want, I want people to get the picture of this. The tail hook, you have maneuvered your airplane, the windshield, and, and describe for me, you showed me one that you have at your home. The windshield of the F-4 is a vertical sort of a long oval type with a flat bottom thing with an inch thick glass, right? Yes, it's about, about an inch thick. It's, it's sloped uh, very sharply in front of the pilot. Um, so with the hook in place, I'm looking at the hook about right there. And... Um, it started to, to gouge a few holes in the windshield. A few little cracks started to appear, and uh, I had to move the hook to the bottom of the windshield and place it on a, a very small metal area that we used for uh, de-icing. Hot air came out of this little metal uh, section just beneath the windshield. Uh, that's on the F4C model. Other models, it's different. but. Uh, by, we were trying to stay away as far away from his airplane as we could to stay mm -hmm. out of the turbulence coming off the bottom of the wing. 
Right. But that little, that little bit of vertical movement on our part didn't seem to change things. Uh, so we were still able to keep the hook against the windshield and push. Now the, the hook swivels from side to side. It's held down hydraulically, but it, it is allowed to swivel from side to side. And there was no way we could fly perfectly straight uh, so the hook would slide off the windshield. So and you could push it about what, like 20 to 30 20 seconds? 20 to 30 at seconds time. at a time. And we'd back up 8 or 10 inches, put it back in the middle of the windshield or, or down at the bottom of the windshield, add the power, and go again. And so we were keeping his vertical speed at about 1,500 feet a minute. And then uh, our left engine caught on fire. So we had to shut the left engine down. We went back in, tried it again. Uh, but now the, with one engine, we were only able to, to hold the vertical speed at about 2,000 feet a minute. And I told Steve, it's, it's uh, getting rough because with one engine out, the airplane has a tendency to fly sideways. Mm -hmm. um, so I was having to use rudder to keep the airplane perfectly straight, which, uh, although that doesn't sound like a big deal, under those circumstances, it did make it more difficult and I said, Steve, I've got to crank this thing back up. Ordinarily, you, de you never restart an engine that's been on fire. Uh, but in this case, I thought the airplane's going to go in the jungle anyway. It doesn't matter if we do more damage. So I restarted the engine, and it lasted for about two minutes. Caught fire again, and I said, well, we've got to shut it down and leave it shut down. Otherwise, we may blow this thing up. And this increased your descent rate then, it, right? It increased the descent rate back to about 2,000 feet a minute. So we continued uh, the remainder of the push another 8 or 10 minutes on one engine. Uh, when we got down to about 6,000 feet above the ground, uh, that's as low as I wanted to go because people start shooting at you with rifles and pistols and throwing rocks at you. So uh, we backed out from under him. Uh, he did have a, one radio working, and we told him to go ahead and punch. And uh, we saw both seats leave the airplane, watched both parachutes open, and then Steve and I headed back to the northwest a little bit. Uh, he, had, he had been keeping track. All of our nav system was out, and he had been keeping track of where we were uh, by following a map. And uh, when he reported to the rescue people where these guys went down, uh, when they got out there, he had them pinpointed within one mile. And there it is. Talk about this, uh, this art piece. Uh, I was at a military reunion in uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico. And we were all sitting around uh, having a cool one and telling war stories. And this artist that's been sitting there listening to some of this uh, says, I'd, I'd like to hear a, a story about something besides a, a dogfight. Well, I really would have rather told him about my dogfight, but uh, <laughs> said, well, I, I can tell you one. I don't know what you can do with it. And I described the event to him, and he said, I think I'd like to, to do a picture of that. And this is the result. Thank you uh, very much. I'm going to invite Matt up here, uh, Matt Dittman. I uh, told you KMU is planning in May. Well, I'm going to let Matt tell you about it, because that's why he's here. Matt?